I just want to begin by welcoming you all to the space. And for those of you who haven't been here before, or um, who don't know what the Archive for Research in Archetypal Symbolism is, um, and that's a name that sounds pretty esoteric to a lot of people, so I'm just going to say a little bit about what it is. Um, so we're in the auditorium space of the Carl Jung Center of New York, and upstairs on the third floor is the archive, um, and you'll get to drink wine there and meet people mm -hmm. after the show during our reception. Um, so what the image is, is um, it's an old-fashioned card catalog where you can actually hold the images with, with your hand, um, which might be a rare experience in our day and age. Um, so the way it works is you can choose a symbol to search, perhaps something you saw in your dreams, like a donkey or a robe or a boat or a tulip, and then you use the collection to find illustrations of that symbol from different cultures and time periods. It can help you understand your dreams or give you a larger cultural and historical awareness as you make an artwork. Or it can just be a different way to explore works of art. So this event tonight is part of the Acrazine series. Um, I'm the curator of the series. Um, and what Acrazine is, is a um, reading and performance event series which invites artists create work in response to one symbol from our collection. Um, another new component of Ecrazine is the Poetry Portal, which is a web, a, web a web page showcasing some of the works that are presented at our events. Um, so the newest piece on the Poetry Portal page is a poem based upon the mirror archetype, which you'll hear read tonight by Amy Wollaston. Um, coming up next week, I think, we'll have featured on the Poetry Portal site um, Akima Zane's poem in response to the symbol of ashes. And we're trying to expand the poetry program here so that we can host more events and publications, as well as provide better financial support for more writers um, who want to engage in archetypal research. So please, if this kind of work interests you, Come explore the archive. It's open Monday and Wednesday from 10 to 6, and um, let your friends know about it. And so, um, to end my spiel and um, segue into a discussion of the mirror, which is um, the thematic focus of our evening, um, I want to share a passage that I came across the other day as I was leafing through a collection of essays by George Bataille. If you're not familiar with his work, I'd characterize him as a lapsed Catholic surrealist <laughs> poet pornographer. <laughs> <laughs> the mirror is foundational to his way of thinking, as he opposes the idea that the world has meaning and instead believes in a kind of ecstatic materialism where there's no depth, only surface and all things reflect other things. So this is from his well-known 1931 essay, The Solar Anus. <laughs> A very short excerpt. So he says, It is clear that the world is purely parodic. In other words, that each thing seen is the parody of another, or is the same thing in a deceptive form. Ever since sentences started to circulate in brains devoted to reflection, an effort at total identification has been made, because with the aid of a copula, each sentence ties one thing to another. All things would be visibly connected if one could discover at a single glance and in its totality the tracings of an Ariadne's thread leading through into its own labyrinth. A man who finds himself among others is irritated because he does not know why he is not one of the others. 
In bed next to a girl he loves, he forgets that he does not know why he is himself instead of the body he touches. Without knowing it, he suffers from the mental darkness that keeps him from screaming, that he himself is the girl who forgets his presence while shuddering in his arms. The planetary systems that turn in space like rapid disks, and whose centers also move, describing an infinitely larger circle, only move away continuously from their own position in order to return to it, completing their rotation. Movement is the figure of love, incapable of stopping at a particular being and rapidly passing from one to another. Um, and so next we're going to have Ami Ronberg, who is the director of ERAS, and she's going to say a little bit more about the space and um, give you a further introduction to the symbol of the mirror. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. First, I must thank uh, Miriam Atkin for curating this, working with us on poetry and on the poetry portal. Uh, and she's done most of this work today and got everything together from flyers to people to introduction. It's been, it's wonderful to, to have her with us at ERA, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. So I just want to say a few more words and I do hope you come up after the, the program to the event upstairs where we have some wine and as um, Miriam mentioned it's uh, open to the public and um, it's free of charge you can just come in and research and look at pictures or do anything that we offer in the archive. You can also, if you can't make it here, use it online. You can access it, all the 18,000 images online, which the images you've seen here are of a few examples of the ones of Mira that we've been showing, and you can become a member. And so, um, also we have a free newsletter. It's called Aras Connections. And that's where the poetry portal appears, and you can, if you want to subscribe to the poet, uh, to the to the Eras Connections, just sign up down at the front of little table down there, or tell us, and we can put you on our mailing list. And we send it out four times a year, and it it contains articles on art and symbols and mythology and all way all ways of looking at art. Um, we also publish books. Um, this is the most recent book we did called The Book of Symbols. It was published by Taschen a few years ago and, and I must say they're doing very well with it, which makes us very happy. And it was translated into six languages. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> And this is very dark, at least I can't see much, but I want to introduce my colleagues. Um, uh, Alison Tuso, uh, are you back here? here. Yeah, there you are, here. <laughs> in the red jacket. Uh, and she is our Aras Online uh, editor. <laughs> she, so she, she's the one who helps you with everything online when you need some and whatever yeah. connections. And Kako Ueda. Mm -hmm. She's our editorial assistant and she works with adding new pictures to the archive. And we have also Tal Hurwitz doing all the photography right in front here. Thank you. He's our consultant. So um, I just want to, before we start, read a little piece from the Book of Symbols on the mirror. Our English word mirror comes from the Latin mirari, or wonder, or marvel at. So the wondrous nature of the mirror is how it draws our imagination into its seeming depths. 
the sense that beyond the mirror image of our immediate, immediate reality might be seen something entirely different. And I think tonight we are looking forward to see what our uh, poets and musicians and singers will find through and in the mirror. So welcome everybody. And I'm just going to announce our order of performers. So um, first we're going to have Amy Wollaston, and then um, Alina Gregorian, and then we're going to have a break. And then we're going to have Aldrin Valdez, and Brooke Hare and Rachel Brotman will be ending the night with some um, music. So um, now we can welcome Amy Wollaston. Um, and also, just, um, I didn't mention this, but the, the images that are projected behind each performer are um, the, the image that they chose to respond to, the images of the mirror. So. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is interesting, reading in the dark. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I actually, I really like it. It's, um, physically, it's difficult for me to read in the dark, but emotionally, it's really nice. <laughs> and I have to say that I'm thrilled to be here. I love, Jung is the thinker that has influenced me more than anybody, and to be in this place is a little overwhelming for me, to be quite honest. Um, it's, it's, being invited to do this is kind of a dream come true, um, and I'm really, really grateful and really happy to be here. So I'm going to read my first poem, which is the poem that is published on the website. It's called The Sound That the Looking Glass Makes. On Sunday, January 29, 1939, Virginia Woolf wrote a diary entry detailing her experience meeting an elderly Sigmund Freud at his home in London. At this, their first and only encounter, he would die the same year, Freud presented Wolf with a single Narcissus flower. In the same year, Wolf wrote an autobiographical essay titled A Sketch of the Past, in which she describes a feeling state that had been with her since she was a child, the looking glass shame. She writes that she cannot look in the mirror and take pleasure in her own appearance, though she knows she was born into a family admired for its feminine beauty. She de describes how difficult it is for her to walk into a room wearing a new dress, how self-conscious this experience makes her feel. In this essay, Wolf de also describes being sexually abused as a child and her tomboy phase in the following years. She contemplates an unexplained psychic condition of losing time that she calls the cotton wool, a figure of speech that I believe she has de designated to the lingering dissociative states many people experience, particularly those who are abused as children. In a dissociative state, individuals spontaneously tune out the world. During abuse, children often involuntary disso involuntarily dissociate to keep their sanity intact, and this becomes a way of negotiating reality after the abuse has ended. I am struck by the names Wolf gave to these sensations and by her effort to make sense of them. I think about Freud's potentially symbolic gift of the narcissus, a flower that directly connotes both an obsession with gazing into mirrors and an overvaluation of one's own reflection. To me, Freud's narcissus represents a psychological polarity to the looking glass shame. I wonder what Freud knew without knowing about Wolf. In this poem, I've taken e excerpts of Wolf's essay and her dire entry and reformed them. I wanted to peer into Wolf's looking glass shame from a different angle, from my own perspective. I've also edited my own lines. <clears throat> Every day includes more be non-being than being. What would the looking glass say if it could speak? I'm so sorry, not now. Immense potential, I mean, an old fire now flickering. There is always too much of me to hate. There is never enough of me to hate. Dr. Freud gave me a narcissus. When I stand here, I can barely look at you. I can't think you about you looking at me. I can't look at myself. I remember how I hoped that he would stop, how I stiffened and wriggled as his hand approached my private parts. It opened its mouth, 
It was all made of petals. It did not stop. I can't remember the last time it could stop. A mirror that had a mind of its own and could not stop. I feel that strong emotion must leave its trace. And it is only a question of discovering how we can get ourselves again attached to it. So that we shall be able to live our lives through this from the start. You want it all to make sense. You want to tie it up with ribbons and bows. You want it to have a beginning and an end, like a book. You want it all to be over. At any rate, the looking glass shame has lasted all my life, long after the tomboy phase was over. A mirror that eats people, a mirror that eats itself, a mirror that grows up, a mirror that boys up, a screwed up, very shrunk old man with monkey light eyes, paralyzed spasmodic movements, inarticulate but alert. You know it, you can see it. It doesn't hide itself from you anymore. It wants you to see it for now. As a child then, my days, just as I do now, contained a large portion of this cotton wool, this non-being. Where should we put the mirror? I am hardly aware of myself, but only of the sensation. Where does the mirror belong? A great part of the day is not lived consciously. Who belongs to the mirror? Who belongs in the mirror? I could feel ecstasies and raptures spontaneously and intensely and without any shame or the least sense of guilt, so long as they were disconnected with my own body. Do you find my appearance pleasing? Do I please you? I remember resenting, disliking it. What is a word for so dumb and mixed a feeling? You can do whatever you want to me. I'm not even here. Just as I raised my fish fist to hit him, I felt, why hurt another person? I dropped my hand instantly and stood there and let him beat me. I can't fool you anymore. I don't care. I remember the feeling. It was a feeling of hopeless sadness. It was as if I became aware of something terrible and of my own powerlessness. I don't have to see it if I don't want to. I don't have to do anything. I dreamt that I was looking in a glass when a horrible face, the face of an animal, suddenly showed over my shoulder. Generation before the poison will be worked out, it isn't even my face. Bleed the mirror, pull out all its petals. Mm. And then my second poem is called Eating a Mirror. Have you ever wanted something so badly you actually got it? I didn't know it was possible. What I wanted was to eat the mirror, to make it crack inside my mouth, to make it take me back in time. I swallowed the mirror and it cut me inside, and blood ran down my throat and into my stomach. And then here I was again, 12 years old, watching her do the same things, wanting to love her despite the fact that there wasn't any room for it. There was only room for a standing ovation. It was standing room only. It was a crowded theater. It was too crowded to hear. She never heard. In the mirror, she looks beautiful then and now. Her mind doesn't race with beautiful thoughts. It races with thoughts of beauty. How long will it last? How can I keep this up? I can't keep it up too much longer. When I look in the mirror, I see myself at 18. I've always been 18. I feel like I'm 18. I'm 18 going on 18, 18 as a rose. I was born in 1950. I was my father's favorite girl. I was my father's only girl. Then and now, the mirror tells me that I am daddy's little girl. I was never daddy's little girl. I only wanted daddy's little girl to hold me up. She inhales deeply. She looks away. She thinks tobacco thoughts. I should have daddy's love, love that grows to twice its own size, to a few times its own size, to several times its own size, to a dozen times its own size, to a baker's dozen times its own size, to many times its own size, to five score times its own size, to a four pet times its own size, to tenty wise times its own size, to an ox game times its own size. Begins to wiggle and bend. It is a fun house mirror and I'm short and shimmy. Her hand, hair stands up. He calls me Susie. A hope, a wish, a prayer, a spell. You look just like her. Not in the mirror. I want to feel her love. I want it so much that the mirror inside me sends me another, almost the same. A mirror reflection slightly askew. A nose where the eyes should be. A mouth where the face should be. A lip where the breast should be. A chin where the girl should be. A breast where the eye should be. A chin where the knee, the knee should be. A shriek where the heart should be. Will I notice? Does it matter? I'm a little girl. I can have a fantasy. Just me and her. No one will hurt us. My dream is a lie. She needs him. She can't see herself in the mirror without him. She needs to be held up by some prop, human or artificial. She needs him to stand behind her, his arms slung under hers, his hands clasped over her heart. She needs this so much that she may see herself. 
she'll turn into smoke and the mirror will crack. I forgot this. I remember it now. Now that the mirror is inside me, it tells me everything with its tiny cuts. I can't pretend anymore. I can't make it something it never was. The vomit, I vomit the shards of mirror back up and they shimmer on my tongue. I grind them in my teeth, the mirror turns to dust, and then I spit it out and then it turns into air. And then my last piece is actually a found text that's a little lighter in tone. Um, and it's called, How to Tell if a Mirror is Two-Way or Not. <laughs> Have you ever been in a bathroom, dressing room, or other private area with a mirror, and you had a feeling that someone was watching you? You can check to see if a mirror is transparent by observing how it is installed, and using a few simple techniques to determine if it, there's a wall behind it. You may have heard about the fingernail test, but there, is a, there are more accurate ways to tell if a mirror is two-way or not. Part one, consider its location. Observe how the mirror is installed. Notice if the mirror seems to be hanging on the wall or if it's part of the wall itself. If it appears to be hanging, try to get a look behind and see if there's a wall. If the mirror seems to be part of the wall itself, there's a good chance it's a two-way mirror, which must be set inside the wall rather than hung onto it. That way, people standing on the other side of the wall can observe someone looking in the mirror. A two-way mirror is a piece of glass coated with a substance called micropane. If you stand on the treated side, you, you see your reflection, but the untreated side looks like a tinted window. If you see a wall behind the mirror, it's a good bet that, there's, that it's nothing more than a regular mirror. Check out the lighting. Look around and determine whether the lighting seems extraordinarily bright. If so, you might be looking to a two -way, at a two-way mirror. However, if the light in the room is relatively dim, you can't immediately see through the mirror, so it's probably just a standard mirror. <laughs> For a two-way mirror to be effective, the light on the mirrored side needs to be ten times brighter than the light on the other side. If the light is any dimmer, it's possible to see through the, mirror, the glass to the observation area. Consider where you are. If you're in a public place and in an area you'd expect privacy, such as a restroom, it's unlikely and illegal to have a two-way mirror. On the other hand, two-way mirrors are frequently used by law enforcement. For example, two-way mirrors are used in interrogation rooms and for lineups. The use of two-way mirrors is closely tied to issues of personal privacy and constitutional rights. Most states have passed additional legislation preventing the use of two-way mirrors in restrooms, locker rooms, showers, fitting rooms, and hotel rooms. If a location has chosen to use a two-way mirror or surveillance, they are required to post signs that notify you. Many places, such as gas stations, will use one-way metal mirrors because two glass mirrors can be destroyed by users. If the mirror in question is metal, then it is not a two-way mirror. Part 2. Examining the mirror. <laughs> Try to peer through the glass. Press your face up to the mirror and cup your hands around it, creating a dark tunnel to block out as much light as possible. When you do this, if the light in the observation room is at all brighter than the light on your side of the mirror, you should be able to see something beyond the glass. Shine a light on it. If you're still not convinced, turn off the lights, then hold a flashlight to the mirror. It can even be the flashlight on your smartphone. If it is a two-way mirror, the room on the other side will be illuminated and you'll be able to see it. Sound it out. <laughs> Tap on the surface of the mirror with your knuckle. A normal mirror will produce a dull, flat sound since it's placed in front of a wall. An observation mirror will produce an open, hollow, and reverberating sound because there is an open space on the other side. The sound of a tapping, two -way, of tapping a two-way mirror has been described as bright or sharp, as opposed to a thud from an everyday mirror. Perform the fingernail test. While not completely accurate, you can still use your fingernail to determine if the mirror is a first or second surface mirror. Simply place your fingernail against the surface of the mirror. When you touch your fingernail to, the sec to a second surface mirror, you can't touch your own reflection. Instead, you will see a gap caused by a second layer over of glass over the mirrored surface. When you touch your finger to a first surface mirror, you can touch your own reflection, since there's no additional layer of glass in between. First surface mirrors are very rare, so if you find one, it's, there's, a, there's likely to be a very specific reason, and it's very possible that it's a two-way mirror. Second surface mirrors are your ubiquitous everyday mirrors. Oh. Due to variables like lighting and the material with which the mirror is manufactured, it, may, it can be really difficult to tell whether you are truly touching your reflection or not. You might think you're touching a first surface mirror when you're actually not. Also, it's possible that for a two-way mirror to be a, to be a second surface mirror. If other aspects of the situation, like a mirror's setting and lighting, have indicated that you're seeing what you're seeing is a two-way, 
Don't let the fingernail test be the deciding factor. Consider the extreme measure of breaking the glass. Mm -hmm. If it's a regular mirror, it will shatter and you'll see the mirror is backing or a solid wall. If it's two-way mirror, you'll see the room behind the mirror. <laughs> you should probably only consider this option if you feel threatened or are in danger. Breaking the glass will cause damage and create a safety hazard. <laughs> Community Q&A. What should I do if I suspect a two-way mirror in a dressing room or of a, in the dressing room of a store? Get out of there as quickly as possible. Get <laughs> alerted law enforcement official of your suspicion so that they can definitively investigate and decide if it's a two-way mirror. How can I tell if there's a camera hidden inside my teddy bear? Oh. <clears throat> Look for any thread stitched into the bear that looks suspicious and feel around the body for any hard objects inside. Also, look into the eyes and see if either of them looks like a camera lens. <laughs> when, when, can I, when I put my finger against the mirror, there is a gap. Does this mean it is a two-way mirror? Not necessarily. It may just be a cheaper perspex mirror or similar with a reflective surface where the reflective surface is on the back. My bathroom mirror is made, is made in the wall, and the mirror opens up so I can put stuff in it. Could it be a two-way mirror? No. <laughs> because it is a cabinet mirror. There would be no point in putting a two-way mirror in a cabinet. I have a two-way mirror. What should I do? If you are really concerned, you can cover the mirror and buy a normal one <laughs> in the place of the old one. You could also maybe break the mirror and see what is on the other side. It depends a bit on where the mirror is. What does it mean if there is no gap between your reflection? It is likely a two-way mirror, but do a second test since it isn't the best way to know. How can I tell who is behind a two-way mirror? Oh. You may not be able to see who is behind a two-way mirror depending on where it is located in your viewpoint. I can't touch my reflection in my mirror. It's stuck on the wall, but the other side of the wall is my bathroom. Could it be a two-way? If there is no gap, it is probably a two-way mirror. If there is a gap, it's a regular mirror. What should I do if I find a two-way mirror? Fingernail test is the easiest test. It is better if you went a dressing room rather than other tests. Thank you. <laughs>
who are like bouncy balls too. In this world, we don't know how to say hello. When I open my mouth, the images disappear. You wear a cravat on a Tuesday. But my marbles are my words. You wear a cravat on a Wednesday. And your mouth is full of sea. When we coordinate atoms in the atmosphere, what will they be? They will be bubbles forming upward. They are conditional adverbs admiring to say hello. But we don't know how to say hello. We are nouns enjoying science. How to speak with nothing to say. Just paint the north side red and wait for sunrise. When your brother says hello, responds with, I know. The way earth looks after it rains. Do you have a magnifying glass? I have a planet. Do you know what it's like to look for a magnifying glass? Examine the space between words, the space between what I want and what you say. This milkshake is small but infinite. How much longer do we need to relax in this forest made from your own doing? The bubbles are no longer going upward. They are aching. They are bountiful. Let's watch them join hands. Hello, it's me. I'm knocking at your door. You're holding too many flowers. I've seen the night planet. I watched it roam. You watched it spin while wearing corduroy. Do you have an image of a home? I have an image of roses, which I've pinned to my lapel. Like an empty folder full of grass. Like a vase without a table. Let's pretend we have names. I'm diagonal next to the guitar, which is next to the other guitar. And I'm perpendicular to particular molecules. You're the argument between siblings. And I'm the fire pit on a damp, probable day. Let's arrange papers for your return. But I'm here. You will need to sign a few documents, so please bring your favorite pen. I'm not sure which home I've become. You're a bundle of lavender. A sign in the atmosphere. A billboard without a sound. Please sign here. What about here? Thank you. I've said my salt prayers. And I'm on my way home. This is the beginning of a new language. You're vertical in a horizontal world. Like post-it notes in space. Like a couch in the middle of an elevator. The lake is too close to the clouds. Let's go to the basement where the lavender is. Do you like herbal tea? I like the way you look in space. Fighting doves to take a breath. This jumpsuit is made out of satin. It's durable, like plexiglass. Yet flexible like cotton. Would you like to try it on? It's part of who I am, but you can wear it too. For just a small price, a couple of cents. <laughs> a couple of dollars. Its value is a bundle of sage. Let's find the blooming turnips. I'm beginning to feel free. Let's find the calm within the cornerstone. Like boarding a train with a dozen almonds. Like creating a language inside other languages. I'm a noun. Nice to meet you. And I'm an adverb. I believe in you. <laughs> Use glasses to climb stairs. Each stair is a new day. Each day is an opportunity to know your name. I am a forest built with other forests. A cloud inside other clouds. Waiting to be held. By a million suns. Thank you. <laughs>
I was not able to do that because of my schedule. So I uh, went on the archive online and um, encountered a lot of images that I would never seen before, um, and then landed on the one that I <laughs> that I. No one's in this college. <laughs> um, so I guess it's an image of a painting. Um, and I'm, I'm curious what it actually looks mm. like upstairs. If it's oh, a card yeah. or if it's a um, oh, uh, printout. Uh, it's Picasso's girl before a mirror from 1933. Um, and I wanted to use the image as a way to write through two different series that's been up, that have been ongoing. Um, and make connections between um, the relationships between um, the Philippines, the United States, and Spain. So Picasso was born in 1881, um, and in 1898, um, Filipinos started a revolution against Spain. Um, so I wanted to uh, write through that time period. I'm going to start with uh, one series called Mananangal. The Mananangal cuts herself in half each night. She takes a bolo knife and chops into her waist, separating her torso from her lower body. The ritual takes place deep in the woods, away from the village. She is a monster. Mananangal, from the Tagalog word tangal, to remove, to separate. Mananangal, one who separates, one who detaches, one who dismembers, one who disremembers. One, two, she cuts herself and grows wings. All absorb the tall water cure of Americans. Bloated brown, the skin knowing, drowning from within quietly the back of throat, the lungs two ships full of blue bodies. A bloated blue, a turgid crying brown, a white map of white fire and white flood, many trenches deep. Mangrove palm houses on stilts aflame underwater inside mouth. General gives the times an estimation. Anonymous senator announces the end of rebellion. Might the water enter between teeth, soaking up language of erasure? Our father. Hallowed be thy curing tongue, lapping clean our throats. There is no one left in Luzon to rebel. We are in the already future, I mean future. The already future scorching the color of the year. The color of the year is not brown, but greenery. Between greenery is scorched numbers, bolos, heads, and all. Who invented me penetrates Manamangal's hued mind. Which half of me, she ponders, is official, as in the war ended officially in 1902, but fighting continued for almost a decade, protracted as in not over, or digestive system dangling outside body. I'm real, right? Fingering her innards from between her butt cheeks. I'm real tight. Her hand, too cold, she bristles, coos in Tagalog, leaving her lower body in the grass. Doubtful historians will ever agree. Mananangal flies overhead, thinking as she does in secret language of betweenness. She is two bodies, sometimes more. Was she ever the wild man Americans portrayed? Doubtful even if the revolution was a revolution. Doubtful even if history was memory or memory was history or whatever. What actually happened, heads dropped in breakfast dishes. In retaliation, Americans took orders, took no prisoners, kept no records, simply cut. This was the official campaign. And now Mananangal wonders what kind of furniture Americans sat on during the war. Was it campaign-style folding chairs, leather-bound brass, studded, catching robust canal asses? She loved a good white ass. Oh boy, she could be the furniture. Maybe she was. A sleepy head. Mananangal gave a damn, but here she was, and where had she been? She lately hated dreams, not for what she saw or where she went, but for how she felt upon waking. Her whole face stunned and stuffy around the cheeks below her eyes. She'd been dreaming of 1899 again, and not quite getting past the 1900s. It was barely morning anymore. Winter trailed the edges of her body. 
Was it numbness in her legs? No, the air was something biting around her, a whole icy aura. Her two blankets felt heavy, wet against torso, feet the coldest. She didn't want to get up. How did she acquire knowledge? Was a heaviness too. Not morning anymore, but too early. The mucousy voices bunching in nasal passage down throats stuck like socks. She was ashamed. Shame was how she learned. Wished she could learn another way. More open air, less traffic jam. Could she be wrong and be held? In another dream, Manananggal hovered outside her family's home in Manila. It was burning. Fuck, she thought, the thought radiating, through, radiating throughout her body. Amazing, her mind was attached, was her body. Her batty wings would not put out the fire. She didn't want them to. She flapped them, moving in little circles above Morong Street. Every surface was gray. The sky was a white eye. Her mind body clenched at the stomach. Was something trying to come out or in? She willed herself down and realized she was not cut in two at the waist. She fumbled for words, her consciousness hissing around whole. Fuck whole. She didn't have whole. Not the time, not the money, not even the desire for whole. Maybe she was lying. Maybe she did desire it. Whatever. Fuck desire. She preferred ambivalent. She faced the burning house and opened her mouth in one big gulp, swallowed all three stories whole. Uh, now, this second series is uh, part of uh, a series. <laughs> um, and it's connected to the first one in that it's uh, the speaker is coming to terms with um, ancestry and um, intergenerational trauma. It's called P. I can't find a newspaper account online of a Filipino who cut off his own penis. I know I didn't make it up. It was the late 90s. My family subscribed to a Filipino newspaper whose, whose name eludes me now. I remember the newspaper's name was in bold, red letters. Online, I find the New York-based Filipino reporter, also bold and in red. I type penis, mutilation, in a search bar. Ten results come up, but none about the Filipino who cut off his own penis. The Filipino reporter's tagline is fair, fearless, factual. Lately, I've been identifying myself as Filipino and Pinoy and become conflicted as to when to use the terms and in conversation with whom. The Filipino, the Filipino. When I was a child, how long did it take me to learn to pronounce words that began with F and PH? I am from the Philippines. I am pair, peerless, pactual. The parenthetical of my shame cups words like a mother clutching to her chest something fragile or forbidden in a hurry to a white doctor who will deem the brown flesh she holds as irreparably damaged. It was a touch and go situation. The man had cut off his own penis. He and his family may have lived in Queens. I had unquestioningly imagined the, the ER doctor who saw them as white. He spoke English. Was the article in English or Tagalog? Or in Tagalog with smatterings of English as when the doctor spoke? The son had cut off his own penis. His mother found him. She may have been accompanied by an aunt. He was not coherent. The doctor expressed dismay at the mother and aunt's decision to place the penis in a container of rubbing alcohol and ice. In her panic, she had grabbed her son's dismembered penis. She asked her sister to fetch a cup, or maybe it was a small cooler, to fill it with ice and rubbing alcohol. Was the penis surrounded by the ice, or did it lie atop the ice, bathed in rubbing alcohol? I realized I had been fleshing out the image without blood. Thus, the rubbing alcohol 
turned red and the ice. The doctor expressed dismay in English at the mother and aunt's decision to place the penis in a container of rubbing alcohol and ice. He may have said the ice was a wise decision, but the rubbing alcohol was not. The rubbing alcohol made it impossible to save the penis. The penis could not be reattached. Uh, this next one, it's my last one, is from the first series I read. It's a short one. Into bitterness and shame, quagmire feelings into feelings. Two mirrors face each other in the painted room. No windows, a single fluorescent ceiling bulb. I'm outside the mirrors, trying to see what I look like reflected between them. The mirrors kiss and crack, glued face to face and shatter. I step on the shards, jump, jump until each shard breaks into smaller and smaller pieces, grains, powder, sharp. I gather the white of them, pour into a bucket of water, soak strips of cloth into this mixture, churning water at the bottom of the bucket so the fabric catches fine crystals. I let the water drain, enough so that the strips of cloth remain damp. Each strip wrapped around my hands like bandages. Shimmer, pull tighter, tighter. I'm ready. In my palms, I clasp the flesh between my legs. Naked mouse. And close my hands shut. Thank you.